Welcome to another episode of the Traditions for the Future podcast. I'm your host, Junius Brutus. In today's episode, we will be discussing the eight most important books of the Bible. In today's day and age, biblical literacy is at an all-time low. The State of Theology research study by Ligonier Ministries found in 2022 53% of adults agreed to the statement, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. With that in mind, we are going to look at the key components of the Bible, the four most quoted books in the Old Testament that are in the New, and the four most important books of the New Testament. So our first book is Genesis. It's quoted about 35 times explicitly in the New Testament. And so the writers of the New Testament and the apostles clearly saw the importance of this book. Um, it is the third, the fourth most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New. And here we not only get the beginning of the story but we get the patriarchs we get the need for the messiah and we learn the covenant of abraham and we hear the first telling of the gospel so genesis 3:15 i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, in the beginning, after the fall, we learn the great need of the Messiah. We hear about this foretelling of someone that will crush the head of the serpent. And the interesting thing about the book of Genesis is that that theme is echoed over and over again throughout the book. It's, there are several different themes in the beginning, in the first few chapters. Um, the image of God is echoed again and again. And with this theme, you think about it, just go through the... the story of Genesis, you have Adam who was supposed to destroy the serpent, but he didn't. And so you hear the foretelling of a Messiah. So, okay, it'll be someone later on. And then the next person that you get to is Noah. And you're thinking, oh, is this going to be it? He's the one that saves humanity he and his family there were only eight people on the ark and so is it going to be him no no um he can't save us you know he gets drunk and he is still full of sin so we keep on looking we keep on looking for the one who is going to crush the head of the serpent and we get to Abraham, he's going to be the father of many nations. Is it going to be him? Well, no, no. Um, you get to Isaac, is it going to be Isaac? No. Is it going to be Jacob? No. Even after the 12 tribes of Israel? No. And so you just hear the echo and the need for the Messiah because someone is set up but it's not them. They're not the one that, that is going to be the Messiah to come. Even Joseph, who reflects Christ in so many different ways. He's one of the most archetypal and foreshadowing figures of the Old Testament. Not even Joseph is the Messiah. He's the one that goes down into slavery, down to the depths. 
and then he is raised up to be the right hand man in Egypt the most powerful one of the most powerful men in the world and it's still not him it's still not Joseph so that's Genesis as the fourth most important the book of the Old Testament in the New our second book is the book of Deuteronomy it's quoted 44 times in the New Testament and the context of the book is that the people of Israel are about to enter into the land of Canaan and the law is stated to them a second time that's actually what the name of the book means as the Westminster Confession of Faith would call it you know the law is a rule of life for believers it was actually never intended by God to justify them in Deuteronomy chapter 6 God says hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one and you know the it says our God not hear O Israel the God that you may have but our God he's our God right now and the law hasn't even been given it was never intended to justify what it was intended to do was to foreshadow Christ and it shows our need for holiness it shows the depths of our sins in everything there is nothing in our lives that is not tarnished by sin and Christ came to fulfill the law to be the perfect sacrifice for us in Deuteronomy chapter 18 it prophesies of, of a greater prophet than Moses if you read the the narrative of the Old Testament you may think it's Elijah but it's not it's speaking of Christ as the greater prophet than Moses and the important another important aspect of Deuteronomy is the law about hanging a dead body on a tree and it says cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree chapter 3 verse 13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree Deuteronomy lays the foundation for the law that Christ would come and fulfill. For those of you who are subscribed to the newsletter, you know that I have gained an appreciation for the Psalms. And I am not the only one who loved the Psalms, but clearly, by the number of times that the Psalms were quoted in the New Testament, so did also the Apostles and New Testament writers. It is quoted a total of 68 times, making it the most quoted book from the Old Testament. And first, it is the songbook of the church. It is what the Old Testament believers used to sing praises to God. And it is the same songbook that New Testament believers used. And so it should be used by us as well in our praise and worship of God, public and private. And secondly, time and time again, it shows the character and nature of God towards believers and non-believers, where the grace and mercy of the Lord is shown time and time again, and His holiness, His perfection, his beautiful nature, his goodness, his righteousness, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his sovereignty, his kindness, all of these things, all of his attributes that we can give a name to are displayed in the Psalms. So we get to see the whole counsel of God in the Psalms. And thirdly, 
it shows the soul of Christ. You know, these aren't just songs that David and Asaph wrote. They were prophesying the soul of Christ incarnate, where you can read the Psalms as Christ's word on earth when he was our suffering servant, when he went to the cross. Psalm 118, bind up the festal sacrifice. Well, what, what happens to Jesus when he's betrayed? He's bound up by the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's bound up by the officials. It prophesies Christ. And so those words are Christ's words. Christ not only sung them as a child and as a man, but he fulfilled them. In the Psalms, we see Christ on display for us. In the Psalms, we find our high priest that can sympathize with us in all our weaknesses. That's why it's an important book. And the last book from the Old Testament is Isaiah. You can't mention important books of the Bible without mentioning the book of Isaiah. It's quoted 55 times in the New Testament. It's the second most quoted book. And it has often been referred to as the Gospel of Isaiah because of its clear, abundant prophecies of Christ as the Messiah. It shows the mercies of God. It shows that God, even in his wrath, is merciful. That he does not forget his covenant. In Isaiah, you find the most famous prophecies of Christ. You know, we hear every year Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 53. In Isaiah, we see God comparing himself to the idols in the surrounding nations and, in, and to the idols that are within Israel and Judah. And he compares himself to them, showing that he is greater than they are. He shows who he is and that he is not a blind, deaf, and dumb God, but he is the true and living God. So that would be the four books from the Old Testament. Let's move on to the four books in the New Testament. So our fifth book is the Gospel of John, because John deals with the deity of Christ several times. John 1, it says that by him all things were made. In John 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus in John 14 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, the deity of Christ is a theme of the Gospel of John. And also another important aspect about the Gospel of John is that it reflects the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, in the imagery of the book. So it begins like Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John, in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, that theme of deity there. And you deal with, um, you see in John, in when Jesus goes to the wedding at Cana, that he turns water into wine. Well, if you 
read Exodus, which Old Testament figure turned water into something else? Moses. And he turned it into blood. And Jesus in John chapter 6, when the people are asking Jesus for more bread, he calls himself the bread of life. The, they, they begin to start talking about Moses there. Moses and the manna. Where they ate the manna and died. But Christ saying, if you eat of me, you will live. And so, the deity of Christ is a central theme. The reflection of the first five books of the Bible are also there. Um, and one other point, notice Christ is in the garden when he is resurrected. Mary thinks that she is talking to a gardener when they come to see his tomb. And then he he calls her Mary, and she knows, it's you, Rabbi. Well, that's a reflection of Adam in the Garden of Eden, where this second Adam has done a greater thing in this garden by being raised from the dead. Well, the sixth book is the Book of Romans. You can't go wrong with the Book of Romans in a list like this. Um, you can only go wrong if it wasn't in the list. Well, Romans is Paul's expansion of what has been done in the Gospel. There's no question about that. Where he begins in a logical progression where he begins with the sinfulness of the Gentiles, and then he moves on to the sinfulness of the Jews. And then in Romans 3, all are condemned under the, under the wrath of God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 3, 23. And then he moves on to faith. And remember... Genesis with with Abraham if you read Genesis and then you read uh, Romans you know of the passage that he's speaking of where Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness in Romans 4 then in Romans 5 he goes off of Adam he saying the first Adam and the second Adam death came to all through through one man Adam and life in the second man, Christ. And then you move on to the dealing with sin um, in believers. What are we supposed to do with sin? And then the great and glorious chapter of chapter 8 where we know who we are in Christ. We are the sons. We are adopted children of God and moving on through the book he just progresses from, at the beginning, the fallen state of man to redemption and reconciliation. And at the end, when he has dealt with the communion of saints, he says in Romans chapter 16, soon God will crush Satan under your feet. Well, our seventh book is the Epistle to the Galatians. Um, some people think probably Ephesians is more important. Um, I've spoken to some people, and they say about the same the same list of books, but it's usually um, Galatians or Colossians will fill this slot. Well, I think the book of Galatians should be in this list because of it dealing with what is a true gospel. And what is a false gospel? Paul is dealing with the circumcision party who's saying that Gentiles have to be circumcised to be saved. And he dismantles that argument left and right throughout the book. And in 
the book of Galatians, he also deals with the law and the promise. He deals with that central theme of the Old Testament. In chapter 3, verses 15 through 29, he deals with this this problem of how do you reconcile the, the law and the promise? And he reconciles it beautifully in verse, verses 21 and 22. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would be indeed by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And he continues with the idea of freedom and slavery. And he again references Genesis um, with Sarah and Hagar, the free woman and the slave woman. So, and then he moves on in, into the victory and freedom in Christ that we have by the Holy Spirit. That's why I think Galatians should be in this list. And finally, we're closing out this list with the book of Hebrews, where this book unfolds how Christ is supreme over the law. He is much better than Moses. Far greater than he ever could be. And that is clearly seen in the opening lines of the book. So, long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed their, the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And continuing with the book, the writer goes through the ceremonial laws and shows and shows you that Christ is better than these and that these were only foreshadows and types from the Old Testament of who Christ is. They were to show what Christ would do on the cross. It reveals to you the purpose of the laws that you read in Deuteronomy. It shows you the whole theme of the Old Testament in what it was culminating to, to the sacrifice, to the life and resurrection of Christ. Thank you for listening. If you liked that episode, then be sure to subscribe, share with a friend, and leave a review. If you would like to see more content like this, then subscribe to my newsletter, juniusbrutus.substack.com. There, you will find articles to help you carry Southern culture forward, to advance Presbyterianism, and to equip you in classically educating yourself. Thanks for listening.